We are live. Welcome to Review and Thoughts 1971's The French Connection film. So, before I get into it, make sure you watch Maggie Mayfish's most recent video, The Hero's Journey is Bull, and both parts of BLR's ex-assassin Albertson. Personally, I'm really glad that they are prosecuting at least some of the people who were involved in the insurrection. You know, I heard about this one guy who did it because there were these two women promising him a threesome. He's being charged with a coochie coochie coup. So, I am going to start this video by saying I really love this movie, although I do take issues with its politics. There are going to be some jokes in this video, and I will at times get serious. If you're looking for a review that talks about, oh, you know, the movie doesn't really hold up, it's been outdone by little movies, because of that, it's not that much fun to watch today. Whether you agree with that assessment or not, this is not that review. I will go into the politics, though. So, without further ado, let's pick our feet in Poughkeepsie. Time to investigate this thing. Let's dig into the bad coffee and pizza. Yeah, I couldn't really decide which of them I like better, so I just did both. I realize this video is long, and I do what I can to make it worth your time. So, the, yeah, the movie is rated R, and so is this video, and I, let's see, yeah, the, I, yeah, I wasn't quite able to find information on why the MPA rated it an R, but it's likely because the swearing exceeds PG, and some of the violence, I think, also exceeds PG. And this was before the PG-13, which was implemented in 84. So, yeah, that's that's why. And that brings us to... Right, and this was my first viewing. I just got done watching it. Well, I got done watching it and then I had lunch. And yeah, so it's very fresh in my mind. And the reason that I decided to do this was it was added to, or yeah, it might have been added a while ago, but I realized that it was on Disney Plus. So, you know, it's not costing me any money. It's a movie I hadn't watched before. And yeah, you know, I've, I've been hearing about it for years. You know, it's one of those movies, Mark Twain said that classic novel is one that everybody should have read, or sh should read, but no one wants to read. This is a classic movie that, you know, yeah, some people are not going to want to watch this, but there's, you know, you can, I, th I think it's very compelling to look at older movies and, like, see where th where trends started and when things changed and stuff like that. So, yeah, and, you know, some of my favorite movies are from the 1970s. Uh, yeah, prime example being Halloween, but also, you know, Taxi Driver's amazing. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a very big fan of... I, I don't only watch new movies. It... I think probably because when I was a kid, my parents were showing me movies from, like, decades past, you know, from their youth. So, yeah, I've just always been watching movies that weren't recent. So, the plot. 1971, a pair of NYPD detectives in the Narcotics Bureau. Let's see. Um, I guess... Yeah, they... they I think all I will say is they, yeah, we see them work to try to get drugs off the streets. And, let's see, the, that brings us, let's see, oh, right. A lot of Americans hate French people. That by itself is not wrong. I'm not telling you not to hate people that you think deserve to be hated. 
unless they're members of a minority, but a lot of modern Americans don't really think about why they hate the French. They've just always hated the French because everyone around them hates the French. I've heard a couple of different reasons, so I will briefly go over them. They're arrogant. No more than Americans are. Keep in mind, they went for democracy before America did. They literally inspired a lot of other countries to change the way the country is run. That's something to be proud of. Some people hate the French because they refuse to go along with the invasion of Iraq, which is down to them actually looking at the lack of evidence, how badly reasoned that invasion was. And one of the really big ones is that a number of Americans hate the French because of World War II, calling them cowards, which is ridiculous considering all of these French resistance members risking their lives and saying they're ungrateful for being rescued by America. The American military bombed French towns and cities when all they had to do was wait out the Germans that, you know, they had already, they already had them surrounded. Just wait until they run out of food and they will surrender. You don't have to destroy French buildings to do it. And you cannot for a second convince me that Americans wouldn't be furious if another country destroyed some of their buildings and called it helping. And yes, de Gaulle did take credit. So hate him, hate the person, not the people. How would you feel if the entire, if the people of an entire country hated you because of what one of their leaders once did? And that brings us to, there we go. Don't know why it lagged, but can't always be helped. Here we go. That brings us to the writing. This was written by Ernest Tidyman, R.I.P., and Robin Moore, R.I.P., wrote the novel, and yeah, a couple of different, let's see, yeah, he did also write some screenplays, but otherwise he wrote some books that got turned into, into movies, but yeah, Tidyman he, let's see, he has ten, uh, yeah, he has ten TV writing credits, twelve movie writing credits, and let's see, yeah, the first actual movie of his was the same year, was Shaft, so, and that's, that's part of, you know, he, he is credited for, uh, right, for which he wrote both the novel and the screenplay. He is also credited for the novel for the 2000 Shaft movie and the 2019 Shaft movie based upon the character of John Shaft from the novel by. So that is some of, but yeah, you know, he's written other big genre pictures from the, the 70s, right? He wrote the, uh, I'm guessing this is the second Shaft movie, Shaft's big score. I'm afraid I haven't watched any of the Shaft movies. I'd like to. Or, uh, other than the 2001. I'm not completely without culture. Yeah, several other, well, we, let's see, one called Street People, Last Plane Out, Report to the Commissioner. So, yeah, I haven't watched them, but, you know, clearly this is something that, yeah. Now, I do want to briefly say, the IMDb goofs list four plot holes, and I agree with their assessment of three of them. The There are a couple of issues with the writing. Now, let's see. So, quoting a fellow critic, in review and variety statements, so many changes have been made in Robin Moore's taut factual reprise of one of the biggest narcotic halls in New York Police history that only the skeleton remains, but producer Philip D'Antonio Antony and screenwriter Ernest Tidyman have added enough fictional flesh to provide room director William Friedkin and his overall top-notch cast with plenty of material, and they make the most of it. I have not w read the original book, and I don't know that much about the original case, so I couldn't really speak to that myself. And let's see. Right, so MDB Trivia has a few things. 
The first draft of the screenplay was written by Alexander Jacobs, who had penned Point Blank in 1967. This was dismissed by William Friedkin and Philip D'Antoni. The second draft was wrote by Robert D. Thompson, who had been Oscar nominated for They Shoot Horses, Don't They, which is an excellent movie, and again, with, with an excellent script. And again, this didn't meet with the approval of the film's producer and director. Then D'Antoni came across the galleys to a novel called Shaft by writer Colin Thomas Tidyman. They both liked that they both liked, so Tidyman was hired through D'Antoni, and Friedkin had major input in the finished screenplay. And William Friedkin, never one to mince words, called the original source novel thick-headed and refused to read it. Ernest Tidyman only added the huh, one of the most one of the people's favorite sequences to the screenplay when no studio in town would touch it. An article quoted some of the performers as admitting that they pretty much ignored the dialogue in the script and used terms and phrases the police advisors gave them during rehearsals. Ironically, the screenplay won an Oscar. But Owen Rose Ro Roisman the film's cinematographer maintains that the dialogue in the finished film is almost exactly as that in the screenplay he read during production. So, you know, it is disputed. This is a really strong script. They... People who know police work know that a lot of it is tedious. Like, it is nowhere near as exciting as movies make it look. And this finds a very good balance between ta just putting the tedium on screen without it getting boring for us to watch and every so often something really exciting happening so yeah the, you know a lot of people hadn't really seen anything quite like this before you know one of the movies i put up behind is the also excellent at bullet which there are definitely realistic aspects of that, but it is a movie where, like, there's a lot of, like, plot points in that one, so you're always, like, reacting to new stuff in the plot, where with this movie, like, I wouldn't really say it's the plot, it's mostly this, this cat and mouse thing, because, like, the cops know... S at least some of who are some of the people involved from the start of this movie and it's not like the cr the criminals this is not their first first rodeo so yeah they're you know they are looking over their shoulder for cops so it is this thing of just will they be able you know who who is who outsmarts the other kind of thing and just seeing yeah, how how tough it is to work the streets as as a cop, you know, and yeah. So, right, plot twists. I wouldn't say there are that. Um, there are not too many, and they're not bad. I think some people, modern audiences, might uh, already have found. You know, I've read a bunch of reviews from people who watched it more recently. They thought there was too little, you know, that, that the plot should have been, you know, that there should have been more of it. And some people also really hate it that this is a movie that tells you very little. And I'll, I'll get more into that in a little bit. But yeah, I, I think it's great when you can, when you can make that work. And I think this movie does. I, I think I get being frustrated today if you go into it and you haven't like looked up what any of this stuff means and such and you're struggling to follow it but you got to remember ultimately the movie was made for the audience the you know for the the contemporary audience it wasn't made for people to watch 51 years down the line and be like well I don't understand that well you know I, I also I I I find it frustrating when people give a negative review to something when really all you have to do is remember the things you saw in the movie and then, you know, Google it when you get home from the theater or whatever and then, you know, apply this new knowledge and, you know, some movies are not meant to be understood as you're watching them, only afterwards. We're just, we're way too... 
we're way too spoiled today when it comes to entertainment, I think. And, and when it, not for, not for some things, not for representation, not for, you know, bringing up progressive themes and such, but when it comes, like, not all art is supposed to just be you looking at it and taking it in and then, you know, understanding it immediately. So, the direction. I believe that the director's name is pronounced William Friedkin. But I've heard some, including people who worked with him, and he seems like the type who would get angry if he constantly had to correct people's pronunciation of his name. So they're either being careful to pronounce it, or they're trolling him. Either way, I'm on their side. Pronounce it frickin'. And considering how many F-bombs he drops in interviews that I watched his research, that's what I'm going with. So, William Frickin, he has directed 20 movies up to this point, starting in 67 and the most recent one in 2017. So for those playing the home game, that is 50 years and 20 movies. He is not a person who just craps out whatever he, you know, I'm not saying all of his movies are good, but he's not someone who just, he, you know, just puts something out just to have something, you know. Although he did make, okay, so from 67 to 71, he made five movies. So maybe that aspect came later. Or maybe people hate working with him. I think that might, there might be a, a bit of a mix of, of those. So I have to admit, I, I realize I put The Hunted back there, and I don't usually do that for movies I haven't watched yet. I do own a copy if someone very badly wants it. I, I believe I put it in the schedule, but if someone wants me to do it, like, super soon, you know, post it in the comments, I'll see what I can do, but yeah. Other than this, I watched The Exorcist, which I, I admire. It is one of the funniest movies that people think are scary of all time, and he directed the 2000 movie Rules of Engagement, which... I, I'm going to paraphrase an excellent review I read. The longer you spend watching the movie, the more you realize it's not about what it thinks it's about, and what it's actually about is not that interesting. So, not the, I'm not his number one fan. Uh, fan. I did not found the William Frickin' f fan club. But I do think he did a really, really solid job here. He also has 13 TV credits as director, and one documentary. Ooh, he interviewed Fritz Lang. Okay, that gets him some cred in my book. That is, yeah. Now, the director inten intentionally filmed this similar to a documentary, so that it would feel like we were on the stakeout, on the chase. And audiences really responded to the movie, and it is easy to see why. It really, like, holy crap. This is a movie that grabs you by the throat from minute one and does not let go until the credits start running. And even then, it's like, wow, that was... Yeah, I... So, so yeah. By now, I guess it's been at least half an hour since I finished watching it, and my pulse has not evened out yet. Like, this is, this is a really, really tense movie. It really works. Like, I, there's very little in this movie that they set out to do, that they tried to do, that didn't work. Now, at the 44th Academy Awards, this won Best Picture over A Clockwork Orange. I mean... I don't know that I would go that far. I think overall, I would say A Clockwork Orange is the better movie, but... I mean, you can't ask me to go against Kubrick. The man was a genius. He was a madman, and he was a real a-hole to the people he worked the worked for him. He didn't work with anyone. But the movies he made, holy crap. I would say it's close though. In in I I would say it's 
it's a it's a cl it's a close second, I would say. But no, not sure. The Oscars do the runner up thing. So let's see. Right. According to IMDb Twitter, yep, yeah, 20th Century Fox were not thrilled about producer Philip D'Antoni's suggestion that Willem frickin' direct the film, with only the night they raided Minsky's and the boys in the band to his credit. Frickin' was very much an untried talent. However, because D'Antoni had pushed for the equally untried Peter Yates to make Bullet, the studio relented. Which, yeah, that holy crap, that was an untried... I, I just got done rewatching it, and it really, it holds up. Like, yeah. That, that, and a huge amount of very smart decisions made by the director in that movie. So, I looked up Frickin's IMDb bio, and again, like... As, as much, there are things about him I don't like, but he cited The Babadook as the scariest movie he's ever seen, so, and I would definitely say there are aspects of that that are inspired by The Exorcist, and yeah, just, Babadook is not for everyone, but it is amazing, it's one of the best horror movies in many, many years, I, 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 yeah, just real quick. Okay, so my horror movie cred, so you don't think I'm some plebe here. Other than the original Halloween, which, you know, other than the, the new, the David Gordon Green Halloween movies, the original is the only good Halloween movie. I have watched all of Friday the 13th, all the Nightmare on Elm Street movies, I greatly prefer the 1982 The Thing to any other version. I greatly prefer the 1986 The Fly to any other version. In general, John Carpenter and David Cronenberg are horror movie royalty to me. So, it's not that I only watched one horror movie. And, let's see... Hmm, did I? Oh, there we go, yeah. So, quoting some fellow critics. Yeah. For the first chunk of the movie, we see two separate stories. The cops solving the case, and then the drug kingpin working on his next job. After a while, the cops realize the kingpin is who they should be going after. The movie might have taken, taken off better if they knew from the start that he was their target. And I think an argument could be made, but I do also think the the contrast... Yeah, I, get, I think, again, it is a bit of... For one thing, I think this movie would have been exhausting if it kept to the pace of the the just... Yeah, you know, from, from when they start following the the... I believe his name, uh, no, that's not a spoiler. His name is Jeanier. I think. I'm not great with, it. I love the French people. I love a lot of their culture. I am not the best at their language. But yeah, Jeanier, from when they start following him, the movie, it, it would be exhausting and tedious and unbearable if the way the movie is from when they start following him, if that was the entire movie, that's one thing. And another is, again, 1971, I think, I I would say it's a bit like one of those westerns. I'm, the, uh, the, yeah. Especially something like Once Upon a Time in the West, and The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, where we, the audience, meet the antagonist and the protagonist very early on, and they have a very strong, defining introduction. But they don't start going directly after each other until a little while later. And that actually also, it, it allows the movie to build them up separately before they, you know, what what is that saying? When, when, um, when an 
when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object. You can't set up both of them as an unstoppable force and an immovable object if you don't see them apart first. Otherwise, it's just not going to have the same effect. I, I guess, arguably, you can today, but cinematic language has evolved a lot. Back then, you could not. And it, seeing Chaunier in Marseille and, like, just the way he goes about his day, and then you see these cops. It's just, these really are, they are worlds apart. You know, this is, you know, for, for a number of people, this movie is America versus France. You know, it's American sensibility versus French sensibility. And that is something that really works. I just, I, I wish fewer people hate the French, or at least, you know, hate them for the, the right reason. Which, I should also say, if you're, like, British and you hate the French, I completely understand. A hundred years of war will do that. And... Let's see... Yeah. Quoting fellow critic Pauline Kale, I believe it was... Kyle, I forget his last name, I'm afraid, but Brows held high, although he doesn't love that term now that he knows what it means. He refers to Pauline Kale as word murderer, or murderer using word, something like that. I can't do an impersonation, so I'm just going to read it in my own voice. It's no wonder that the French Connection is a hit, but what in hell is it? It uses 86 separate locations in New York City, so many that it has no time for carnival atmosphere. It crashes light through. I suppose the answer we're meant to give is that it's an image of the modern big city as Inferno, and that Popeye is an existential hero. But the movie keeps zapping us. Though the French connection achieves one effect through timing and humor, when the French Mr. Big, played by Fernando Rey, outwits Popeye in the subway station by using his silver-handed umbrella to open train doors. Most of its effects are of the psycho-derived blast-in-the-face variety. Even the expert pacing is achieved by somewhat questionable means. The ominous music keeps tightening the screws and he heating things up. The noise of New York already has its tense. The movie is like an aggravated case of New York. It raises this noise level to produce the kind of painful tension that is usually described as almost unbearable suspense. But it's the same kind of suspense you feel when someone outside your window keeps pushing down on the car horn and you think the blaring sound is going to drive you out of your skull. This horn routine is, in fact, what the cop does throughout the longest chase sequence. The movie's suspense is magnified by the sheer pounding abrasiveness of its means. You don't have to be an artist or be original or ingenious to work on the raw nerves of an audience this way. You just have to be smart and brutal. Holy crap, I copied in a lot. Okay, I'm just gonna leave it. You can look it up yourself. She's, she's great. She was great. R.I.P. And, yeah, so, there's this scene in this movie where we see this guy dressed as Santa. And, you know, at first, it's, oh, he's making the kids happy. And then suddenly, he spots a criminal takeoff. So, he yeah, he takes off running, chases him down. Turns out, he's actually an undercover cop. Helping another cop do the, the good cop, bad cop thing. Only the bad cop is actually super confusing and weird to the suspect, which really gets him to lower his guard and confess. Now, the scene I just described, that's like the second scene in the movie. That's It's one of the first things we see. There are tons of movies out there that would give anything to have just one scene this memorable. And here it's just the start. It's the first of many to come. And... Yeah, so I'm not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad, but it fits with what came before. And I love the way the movie ends. It does not employ Deus Ex Machina or other convenient writing. It does feature a callback that I thought was amazing. I was told it was coming, but it was still like... Yeah. It's such a it's such a simple gesture and let and and yet it it hit very very hard. So I was not able to get a copy of the book to either read through or listen through 
but I do hear that the book is also excellent. And that brings us to the characters. Gene Hackman played Detective Jimmy Popeye Doyle. And yes, the, the, um, the Popeye Chicken franchise is named after him. Not the, not the, yeah, you'd think it was, you know, Popeye olive oil and the, yeah, but. And, let's see, yeah. Hackman won the leading man Oscar that year. Yeah, I think overall, I, th I think his is the the best that I know of from that year. Yeah, and let's see. Yeah, you know he is. He's a he's a cop driven by his gut feelings and he he is relentless he never relents he is he is completely without the ability to relent and it is very compelling to watch and basically like if not for his 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 fellow cop you know, calming him down every so often, he, it seems like he would explode. N not like with a, not like TNT, but like just the, the way he treats suspects would get completely out of hand more than it already is. Now, Fernando Ray, RIP, played Alan Chanier and yeah, so he was the 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 drug kingpin himself, and he there there aren't that many like individual moments where you really like he he has a few where you'll like see a bit of acting, be like that was that was good, that was I like that. He has this charm to him whilst at the same time being able to you know ask for terrible things to be carried out you know he has a personal assassin for the the cops that are following them and he genuinely doesn't seem to mind. He does, I'm, I'm not sure he even considers it a necessary evil that they sometimes kill cops. Now, Roy Scheider, R.I.P., played Detective Buddy Cloudy Russo, and he is the, the friend that calms down the, the, yeah, Popeye. William Shatner was considered for the role. I'll admit, when I think William Shatner, first I think Michael Myers, you know, white mask. Second, I think Kirk. So I, I'm having trouble picturing him in in the role. But I don't know. I mean, he's played other stuff. I just haven't seen very much of it. Roy Scheider, according to MDB Trivia, Roy Scheider was convinced he had lost the part as he stormed out of his audition. That, in fact, was the reason why he was cast. So, yeah. And I don't think I'm going to talk too much about the other... You know, there are a bunch of... Ah, what's the word? Yeah, it's it's a great cast. You know, everybody did really great work and yeah, RIP to the ones who have since passed. I th I think I will very briefly talk about 
Marcel. Should have looked this up. Botsufi as Pierre Nicoli. He is the assassin, and wow, he is just yeah. You hate this guy from like minute one. He is such scum. He's just so hateable. But he also has this kind of air to him of like he does and like ah, he's not like a, this lower level street thug that that you wouldn't be able to respect but no he he has this air about him where he seems that just yeah it, he did a really great job and That brings us to the dialogue. So, you know those really annoying conversations in movies, you know, where two or more characters will say things that each of them already know, so why are they saying, out loud, saying them out loud except for the sake of the audience who don't know yet and need to know? Well, this movie doesn't. Doesn't know them, doesn't have them, and is all the better for it. You figure things out from context clues. Sometimes they will th say things that we need to hear, but it's not awkward, it's not staged. It's natural, these are actual conversations. And when a lot of info needs to be given, it's not a boring exposition dump where we're just looking at the person or people talking. We see who and what they're talking about. It's visually interesting, it's dynamic. And the the dialogue came from the two actual cops that the movie is based on acting out the scenes saying what they did say in those situations and yeah like the the authenticity is just through the roof here it's just absolutely incredible and very like catchy memorable dialogue a lot of it the cinematography was handled by D.P. Owen Roisman, who has 28 credits between 1970 and 1995. So, yeah, once again, that's, that's more than one per year on average. So, yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> and some of them are music videos, because IMDb does not list movies and music videos into separate categories, even though they have a short and a video category. Anyway, yeah, let's see. So, Wyatt Earp, The Addams Family, the, the 1991 Addams Family. Network, Stepford Wives, 1995 version, Taking of, one, of Pelham 123, 1974, The Exorcist. Yeah, you know, immensely talented I don't know I guess I guess maybe he retired that's certainly a lot of years to not work for a yeah but you know he was immensely talented while he was working I'm almost 100% certain that he is still alive so it's not that's not why the but I'm just real quick gonna look up to make 100% certain he is in fact Still alive, yes. Right, he's from 36, so by 95, he was up in years. So, yeah, that I could understand retiring at that age. But, yeah, the, you know, the, the, the camera is handheld, and there will sometimes be in-camera zooms. And, yeah, like, you know, this is the kind of thing you... We've seen some of this done in much more recent films also. This thing of, you know, basically... Like, the movie isn't actually saying that it is a documentary. And it's not saying that it's found footage or something. But, yeah, you know, this is... Like, I, I imagine a movie like End of Watch by David Iyer starring... Jake Gyllenhaal and Michael Pena, that was probably inspired by this, you know, in, in part. And, yeah, you know, again, obviously that movie moves faster. You know, there, there are aspects to it that they couldn't have done in this one. 
but if they hadn't done it in this one, you know, yeah, we might never have gotten, you know, every everything that we today take for granted at one point someone had to do it for the first time someone had to say wait why don't we do this you know like if you go all the way back there was actually not very much camera movement in really early like they would they would film it as if it was a stage play being filmed by fairly passive cameras you know and Today, we have incredible cinematography, so yeah, anyway. Right, it was the first cinematography credit for Owen Roisman. Director Paul Verhoeven admitted he was inspired to use more handheld photography in his next movie, Turkish Delight, after seeing this film. And as part of the loose documentary feel of the movie, director William Freakin did not use storyboards to plan out scenes, so yeah. And let's see. Now, for some of the dangerous stuff, Frickin was filming. He operated the camera himself because the other camera operators were married with children and he was not. So he was legit. There was some actual risk that he would get extremely badly injured, possibly even die. And he was like, no wife, no kids, whatever. Let's go. And yeah, the movie, the movie is like that. It's... That's that's what the movie is like. And that brings us to the editing. So Gerald B. Greenberg, R.I.P., edited this movie. He had 41 movie credits to his name. The first in 66, the last in 2015. And other than this, let's see. Right, he edited American History X, The Untouchables, Wise Guys, Body Double, Scarface, the 1983 one, Apocalypse Now, right, and he actually, he edited The Boys in the Band for freaking, so... This was not the first time he and the director worked together. And yeah, you know, he does he does great work in those movies. He does great movie great work in this movie. The the handheld never gets like outright unpleasant to look at and the editing keeps it moving very fast without yeah, and and in some of the some of the action scenes, the editing, just yeah, absolutely astonishing. Right, I'm gonna quote a fellow critic here: "The editing done by Joe Greenberg is very real. Characteristic of films made pre-computer-based editing shots are held for longer periods of time. Not as many cuts are used. The editing is almost unnoticeable because it seems to pass by so soft, especially during dialogue. However, conversely, it cuts much more often, but never frantically, during action sequences. See, but still, drama is tensed out by holding long shots, holding shots long during action sequences, and it works. But this never comes to fault. The few times when quick cuts are needed, they are used. In general, the editing satisfies the mood of the film. Let's see. That brings us to the budget yeah so the budget 
was estimated to be one million eight hundred thousand dollars back then and the gross worldwide was 51 million again back then so yeah that is quite yeah and it makes sense because this is if if i was watching movies back then i would probably have gone to you know if i had been born back then i would probably have gone to see it twice at least and yeah like the the they made the money count because it really does feel you know they they actually filmed some of this uh let's see where do we have the um oh the let's see the uh the Yeah, they actually did go to Mosse for for some of this, and yeah, you know that makes the movie look more expensive than if they hadn't. And yeah, like you really get a sense, you know, Sean Ye, he's at home with these amazing beaches and just this, yeah. And, and in fancy restaurants and such, and Popeye and Cloudy are, you know, they're at home on the streets of New York, which is where we meet them. And, yeah, you know, as, as some critics have noted, the movie takes us all over Manhattan. In his book, Reverse Angle, John Simon wrote, Frickin' has used New York locations better than anyone today. And I think I will be vague on the action. I'm, I'm just going to say, you know, we have some chases, especially on foot, and we have some physical fights and such. And... Obviously, some of it must have been staged, because you can't just tell actors to start punching each other. You know, you can't just tell them, okay, now chase each other. You have to plan this stuff out, you know, for the safety of the, the performers and for the camera cre crew to be able to keep up, you know. But it always feels so natural, organic, and unrehearsed it it just yeah and the action is always exciting and intense there's never ah, i would definitely say there's enough of it but for some people that isn't the case and you know obviously the scenes don't go on for as long as action scenes do today uh, you know in, in huge blockbuster movies and that brings us yes that brings us to the music which was done by don ellis r.i.p who composed for eight movies between 1969 nice and 1979 Although the last one, he, he died in 78, so the last one, you know, he, he composed it before the movie. Yeah, a year before the movie was released. And he, yeah, he did an incredible job here. I don't know any of his, ah, he, he scored the, the sequel as well, which, it's not next week. I want to say it's week after next week is when I watch, uh, let me just double check. Yes, week after next is the plan, if nothing happens. And yeah, I, I don't know any of these other movies. He also, he has five television credits as composer. 
and these are also things that I don't... Oh! An episode of Mission Impossible! Cool. But that is... yeah. Right, and one documentary short called Man Belongs to the Earth. It, you know, the score works incredibly well for what they're going for. It's jazz and it's used very sparingly. And, you know, the, the director admits in the interview, I liked it and thus I used it probably too much. And the main theme is very loud. And the movie actually opens on some of the, this harsh, discordant score, but it doesn't last very long before it stops, and it just immediately, like, if this movie was a person, then the opening scene is basically, like, punching you in the face, and somehow, the and, and I mean that as a compliment, you know, it's just, it's not easy to do that. And have the audience say, do that again. That's that's not, you know, un unless you're of a certain predilection, obviously. But, no, it's, yeah. According to IMDb Trivia, it's his first film score. It only runs tw to 22 minutes of the film's running time. And... Yeah, I'm going to quote a few fellow critics here. The nearly atonal score underlines the disorganized elements of the film. Well put. Don Ellis' score ratchets up the tension. Great soundtrack. I thought it might have been Bernard Herrmann. Praise indeed. Very true. He could also have, have done, yeah. The score isn't all that noticeable, but it's a tense, arra tense arrangement that adds some underlining anxiety to some scenes. Stakeouts get more interesting than you would ever give them credit for. And the sound design. So I'm going to just quote one fellow critic here who says that the sound editing is terrible. The tiny pistols sound much bigger and it's distracting. I agree with all the words of that sentence, two sentences, other than terrible and distracting. It's absolutely the yeah, tiny pistols and they sound just they sound like cannons. You know, this is this Terminator 2, it's just it's it's ridiculous. But it works. Like I if I were inclined to duck at that kind of thing, I would be. You know, it just, it's just, yeah, it, it sounds like they're right, it sounds like they're holding the pistol right up against your ear, not, not shooting you, shooting up, but like, you can just, yeah, the, the noise is, yeah, and it, it works incredibly well. I, I get why some people would find it to be distracting and to be a negative, but I, yeah. Quoting another fellow critic, it is said that silence is golden, and in the French Connection, it seems to be just as valuable. While the tense stringy score is important to the film in some aspects, it's not used very often, and instead, director Frickin employs simple background noise. For instance, most of the scenes in the movie simply work with dialogue and city noise. And that helps for the realism. The music is used only when it won't get in the way of the framework of the film. So therefore, background noise suffices wonderfully for most of the action and dialogue scenes. Some of the music is setting-based as well, and so comes from the movie's plot itself and doesn't break the reality theme. Modern audiences might be surprised by the lack of action music, but then surprising welcome help the film as well as add an air of classiness. Yeah, because, uh, you know, we're so used to music telling us how to feel during action scenes, and here it was like, nope, you're on your own. You know, the, the, what can I say? The, the orchestra was sent home. They did their work beautifully, and their services are no longer required. It, it, it works incredibly well. Like, there are times in action scenes than this where uh, uh, an action movie score would have been building um, 
uh, the, the soundscape would have been building, increasing in intensity. And because it's not there, I'm sitting there like, okay, is, is it is it rising? Is it falling? Where are we? When is this ending? And, you know, it's, that's what it is in real life. You don't know when, uh, you know, this, this thing is going to end. You know, that's not what it is for, for cops on the, on the beat. They don't know when it's going to happen, when it's going to end, and, and this kind of thing. And just, it works beautifully. And it also, like, some really classy songs. It, there, there's this bit where they go to a bar and got this, it, you know, live singing. It's, it's great. I, I think I'm going to have to look it up afterwards. I want to listen to it again. So the let's see yeah so you know some people will say the the that it's it's slow paced I found it incredibly tense and fast paced almost unbearably so I I'm really glad this movie wasn't longer it would have been just yeah the the movie without end credits is an hour. And 42 and a half minutes long. And with end credits, it's an hour and 44 minutes long. This was back when end credits were short. If this movie had been 10 minutes longer, I would have, I, I, you know, near the end, I would have been like, okay, I, I don't usually do this, but I need a break. This is, this is getting to be too much. Just, yeah, the, the realism and the pace and the, yeah. But, you know, if you're not used to watching old movies, you might find it slow. Let's see. Um, so this is the part where I I'm supposed to for for a while I I basically forced myself. Okay, you got you got to pick one one thing. What is the best? What's the one best thing about this movie? I can't do that anymore. I just I just can't. The best things about this movie are the writing, acting, directing, and realism. And this is the part where I'm supposed to, where I'm supposed to pick the worst element. Is there a the, the worst aspect? Is it possible to say the worst aspect if you don't think anything's bad? Okay, yes, the worst aspect is that this was one of the many narratives that helped perpetuate the war on drugs. That is the yeah. And, right, so, when I looked at other people's reviews, the worst aspect, according to others, was that it has no interesting characters, which I suppose I can't really argue with. That's, I, it just, it didn't bother me. You know, it's, they're, they're real people. people. People in real life aren't necessarily, that sounds harsh. Fictional characters are, ah... Uh, Hmm. A number of fictional characters are interesting, and not everybody in real life. I don't think I'm particularly interesting myself, so... But yeah, the thing I was most worried about was that it would be copaganda, and... Ugh, the movie, unfortunately, lived down to my expectations, but it's the this is the kind of copaganda that makes you understand why copaganda works. Because it really, like, the, the, it's telling you to side with the people who beat up people and get away with it, and shoot people and get away with it, even when those people are innocent, against your fellow man. So just, yeah, it's incredibly effective. This, this is, this is, yeah, for, for like 102 minutes... I was moving in the direction of being, yeah, on on the side of, yeah, of police. So the thing I was most looking forward to was seeing a classic, and the movie exceeded my expectations. This this is a movie I'm going to be thinking about for a while, going to be recommending it to people, and yeah. So the trailer gives away at least a little bit too much, but it does also give you a good idea of what the movie is like, and I don't know if they could have gotten audience interest without spoiling. So the, oh right, the, the, I 
forgot to note if the poster and cover spoil. So I'm just real quick going to take a look at them. Some of them do, yes. Some of the, the posters and, and, yeah. And I just realized I misread that. I actually did note that. But, yeah, they also give you a good idea of what the movie is like. And... So yeah, when I searched on YouTube for videos about this movie, I really didn't find that much. There was like, there were, there were several trailers, but a, a couple of them were just the, the same. But there were a couple of re-edits. One that I, I'm just going to find real quick the name of Grand Theft Auto V trailer style and a modernized trailer. And those and the original are all excellent, worth watching. Five clips from the movie, some behind the scenes, some reviews, and deleted scenes. But yeah, really not very much. Which is too bad. It's I, don't, I think this movie deserves to be talked about more today. Both, both for the, the positive qualities of the technical aspects and the negatives of the war on drugs yeah now let's you know i i forget who but one critic said that the movie supported a fascist ideology you know this idea that the cops should be allowed to ignore our civil rights and such and yeah it's hard to argue with that so on tomato rotten tomatoes this has a 97% on the tomato meter based on 87 reviews and an 87% audience score based on over 25,000 ratings. The critics' consensus is realistic, fast-paced, and uncommonly smart. The French connection is bolstered by stellar performances by Gene Hackman, Gene Hackman and Roy Scheider, not to mention William Frickin's thrilling production. And of the 87 reviews, only three of them are rotten. The average critic rating is 8.80 out of 10 and the average user score is 4.1 out of 5 and the number 87 the, the 87 percent that's the percentage of users who rated it 3.5 out of 5 or higher so yeah on metacritic the critic rating is 94 out of 100 the user rating is 8.4 out of 10 and Let's see. Yeah, it's been a little while since I checked, but the the most recent were from March 24th of 2020. 18 critic reviews, 22 user reviews, and on IMDb, there were only 374 reviews, which, you know, comparatively, like, something I sometimes... It's two would be Birds of Prey, which you know, came out two years ago, not 51 years ago, and has 2,692 reviews. And if I, let's see... Okay, they, it does have some reviews from, from this year, but yeah, anyway. Let's see... Yeah, and I, I read the 100 voted the best, most useful. And of those 100, four of them voted 1 out of 10, 1 voted 2 out of 10, 2 voted 3 out of 10, 8 voted 4 out of 10, 11 voted 5 out of 10, 8, 6 out of 10, 6, 7 out of 10, 14, 8 out of 10, 17, 9 out of 10, 25, 10 out of 10. So, yeah, that is over half for the, the top three ratings. So gives you an idea of how popular it is and there were 174 links to external reviews on IMDb 95 of them still work and are in English so the overall rating by users on IMDb is 7.7 .7 out of 10 based on 120,266 IMDb users and 33.5% voted 8, 24.1% voted 7, 
16.2 voted 9, 11.3, 10, 8.96, 3.25. So, yeah. Not everybody loves it, but the vast majority. Okay, so this is the part where I sometimes talk about violence and such. That is something, and I, I don't blame this movie for it, because it was a thing in the industry at the time. The blood looks fake. It's, I, I mean, it's especially the color. It's it's too red. But also some of the consistency, the thickness. Like, it, it looks like watered-down red paint or something, you know. And it's, uh, it's something you have to just kind of try to ignore, but... Yeah, obviously, you know, it's it's a lot easier to believe, oh, wow, that guy just got punched in the face if the blood on his face looks real, rather than, oh, wow, that guy definitely got some, some watered-down red paint on his face. That's, I hope he gets to wash it off soon. That's probably really nasty. But it's, it's one of the only, you know, yeah. And that... Brings us to. So, yeah, I recommend this to people who love propaganda, whether it's guilty pleasure or unironically. And, yeah, people who like studying old films because there's really, there's a lot here that's. I'm, I'm making it sound like a museum exhibit. It, it legitimately is. Like, it's it works. If you, if you, for the people who can watch movies this old and are willing to just be swept up, it works. So, this has no extras on Disney+, Plus, but, you know, this movie and its sequel are on there, and I guess I could do a very brief... Let's see if we see. Here we go. So... Other than these two, it has Red Sparrow, Transporter 1, Bad Times at the El Royale, Best Laid Plans, Gone in 60 Seconds, Murder on the Orient Express, and The Counselor, all of which are suggested, you know, recommended as useful on its Disney Plus page. So, yeah, I rate this 8 loose cannon cops that get the job done out of 10. And I... I could sit down and watch it again right away. Like, I I probably won't. I'm probably going to do other things. But yeah, I mean, I have the time. I, I might. It's not impossible that as soon as I stop recording this video, I'm just going to watch it again. Because it, it was amazing. And that brings us to the spoiler sections. I just realized I didn't actually mention spoilers before now. But yeah. From here on out, there are going to be spoilers for the movie. Not for the sequel, and not for any other movies. So, the rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of it's analysis, some of it's MSC, 3K, riff tracks, and other jokes. And, yeah, so the section right after this is thoughts I had while watching, chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, and the like. And the section after that is thoughts I had before watching. So, that brings us... Oops. There. Go. Notes taken while watching. So, immediately, we and the French cop are following the assassin. And after maybe a minute, you know, he, he was waiting for him and he shoots him dead. Really setting the tone. And just, yeah. That's enough. Don't kill him. There's some chance he would have. As the two do the good cop, bad cop thing, twice Cloudy walks towards the camera, stifling a chuckle. Obviously, he's not going to chuckle when the, the guy can actually see it, but yeah. And the... Let's see. And, you know, back in Marseille... Uh, Jeanier is very charming, talking to the other guy, giving a gift to his girl that she really loves to get, and he she gives him a present. And it's such a great contrast, you know, these, look at how rich they are, and then, you know, meanwhile you have 
Popeye and Cloudy on the streets of New York. Yeah. And Roy thinks that they're at the bar to drink, but Popeye can't turn it off. He's always on the job, so he's looking for it. Yeah. And I like the thing with, like, you know, the guy managed to stab Roy. And Popeye tells him, now I'm going to, I had to listen to him talking about this all winter or so, something like that, you know. And yeah, the, the, when they're at the bar, that song, man, that was catchy. And just, yeah. I appreciate how different the different parts of New York sometimes feel like you know you can understand why people would go to that bar like that's really really catchy music and like the singers have like personality and presence and just yeah like and back in Marseille we're told about the celebrity working with them and Charnier I gotta admit I don't know what it was he picked up but you know some I, I guess some kind of some something it seems like he got something edible out of it so anyway you know he picks it up he, he smells it he cuts you know he gets the part he wants and then he discards the rest which you know that's him as a person when he can't use something for his benefit he throws it away might include people certainly he wasn't upset about the french cop his buddy murdered and Popeye makes a milkshake, ruining all the drugs. And the whole thing was so Popeye could talk to his informant without anyone realizing about the informant. You know, and he's like, so, what do you, which, which side, I think, yes. <sighs> Here, you know, and, you know, he, he punches him, for, like, for real. Obviously, the actor didn't punch the other actor, I hope. But, yeah, you know, it looked real and just, yeah. Popeye makes a compelling case, talking to the other cop on his coffee break. And, you know, I like that bit, you know, I wouldn't be coming to you taking away from your coffee break if I didn't think we had something. Because because that's something he understands. He wants his damn coffee. He wants his coffee break. You know, so, yeah. And Mulderick immediately gets off on the wrong Poughkeepsie pick and foot. foot. Almost nailed it, though. Almost nailed it. Roy defends Popeye, so does the other cop. Yeah, the movie's around 41 minutes in, so that's relatively close to whole half, uh, halfway through before our cops and the French kingpin plots meet. You know, basically, like they were on the they were on the trail before Chenier made it to America. But you know, like I guess it also helps that I knew going in that that's what would happen you know but yeah some people have said I mean I was wondering when is the when is the Mosaic plot gonna get relevant to the other stuff you know and yeah you know I, th I think I think it works I think they made the right choice I I understand people who find it frustrating and it's definitely not a move for everyone so yeah very exciting and tense as they tell them first on the bridge then under it then on foot Great contrast between the French kingpin enjoying expensive food and the cops chewing on rubber pizza, undrinkable coffee. Now, as a progressive, I can't help but notice that it's not about rich versus poor, but drug kingpin versus cops on their case. The implication is not that no one should enjoy such expensive food while others starve to death in the streets in one of the richest countries in the world, but that other rich people earn that. Drug kingpins don't. You know, classical war on drugs narrative. In real life, no rich person earned their wealth. They got it by exploiting people and or gambling, whether on the stock market or in a casino. No one should go hungry in a country which so easily can mass produce cheap food. No building that people could live in should be empty so long as anyone lives in a bad place to live or is outright unhoused. White collar crime ruins far more lives than drug running. The war on drugs is an excuse to persecute minorities, and because the U.S. government wants a monopoly on that level of drug sales. Let's see. Absolute dynamite. Yeah, science! Yeah, Mr. White! Very tense. Each time they're close to Chanye tailing him. I love the part that culminates in the subway with Charnier luring Popeye to leave the train and then going back in himself. 
and the little you know sly wave and then at the end you know Popeye and the others have blocked off the bridge out <laughs> just beautiful kind of cuz like you know now now who's laughing now who's you know yeah and But yeah, you know, in, in the subway scene, you know, when Shawnee gets close, Popeye smoothly transitions from yelling at the Fed to, you know, pretending to be a lowly bartender. You know, what was it he said? I don't care how many bartenders you're out, I'm not doing the job. Well, right back at you and hangs up, you know, so, just, I mean, at the time, Shawnee already knows, but it was worth a shot, you know. Not that many people die in this, but it hits you each time. I've seen movies with way higher body counts, honestly, like dozens of times higher body counts, not hit anywhere near as hard. Well, you know, Jason X springs to mind. Slowly walks to mind. He's not a sprinter. Love the car chase, the tense cutting between Popeye and the car, the people and cars in his way. The assassin in the cab, people trying to get into the cab. And he shoots the assassin. I can't deny a feeling of satisfaction. The guy shot a mother. Not on purpose, but still. Like, like what kind of human being looks at that and doesn't think, I gotta wait for a shot where there isn't a mother right there. But, like, just, that's so, that's so disgusting. Just, you know, the, the... Yeah. And I really appreciate that the camera gets that detail. You know, that the, the, the there's just, there's that, that baby carriage staying right there and the, the mother is lying there. And, you know, a couple of, of other women run up and they're going to, like, check on her. And Popeye has to shout them, you know, get, get away, stop looking, you know, because there's a chance they're going to get hit next. But it just, you know, they don't, like, they think, oh, no, is some has something happened to her? They, they want to investigate. You know, they don't stop to think how dangerous it is. The car is dirty, Cloudy. I hope someone has made a parody edit where it smash cuts from that line to a cheesy car wash scene. Ten past four in the morning. Finally, people come for the car. And they were just going to rip it off. They were just going to take the, the top. I'm not going to repeat the word, don't worry. I'm not going to repeat what he said. The word he used to describe them. But yeah, they're... They're just gonna they're just gonna take the the I forget what they're called, but yeah, strip strip the car. You know, they weren't there to make a pickup. We never actually find out why the tail wasn't there on Charnier before the subway. Like Popeye calls to yell about it, and like in real life there was corruption on the force, and the movie doesn't really get into that. But yeah, so the car is taken apart and very exciting ending. I do have more things to say about it, but it's in the next section. And, yeah, just... I... Yeah. Let's see, what was the... I guess... The, uh, I think that's everything that I had for, for this section. Right, I wanted to really briefly, like, you can understand why Mulderig really does not like, you know, the, like, the, yeah, the other cop points out that most of Popeye's hunches, you know, they turn out to be true, but it's small time. They put away a bunch of, low-level drug dealers who, you know, they, they're not making a, an impact on the overall, you know, and then, you know, Mulderig, he's like, well, you know, last time you had a hunch, you got a cop killed, you know, so you, you kind of understand, although I do think he was really pushing it when they're first in the car, and, and Cloudy's also talking, to, okay, okay, Mulderig, just, or Bill, I think he called him, just calm down, you know, just, yeah. And the the and Popeye, you know, verbally explodes at him also, and just yeah. 
But that probably is. There probably are a number of, of comps like that. And that brings us to the final section. <coughs> That's not what the final section is called. The final section is called Notes Taken Before Watching. So, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to watching the sequel. I honestly... Yeah, they. I think they did eventually try to make, like, a TV show out of this. And it makes sense. Like, you know, you could totally see continuing to, to watch. Yeah. Now... Yeah, so the, you know, <laughs> yeah, you know, I mentioned feeling a sense of satisfaction when the assassin was shot, but, you know, obviously what he did was technically not legal, you know, at, at the time, I think today, it's, it's, you gotta really go far before a cop you know, gets into something you can't get away with, but, yeah, you know, he wasn't actually, let's see, right, I did write something, yeah, first I wanted to, let's see, Yeah, so the movie ends on a gunshot, which can be interpreted different ways. The director says maybe he's shooting at shadows now. Because we are told afterwards, Shawnee got away, you know. And, yeah, I I gotta say, I kind of like the, the version where we don't know, you know, yeah, what did he shoot at? Because he didn't stop Shawnee. Uh, we're, we're told that in the, the little, uh, I forget what the part is called, but yeah, afterwards... And the, um, what was the other thing? Yeah, you know, I, I get why Freakin didn't want to make a, a sequel. But why um, Hackman did. So, some people don't like that Popeye's hunches always turn out to be right. And certainly a movie isn't saying that he's a good person, just a good cop. One of the other cops does say that he, a hunch of Pomai's got a good cop killed. But then, you know, that's that's Mulderig. We're not supposed to like Mulderig. Maybe the movie should have explicitly shown at least one hunch turn out to be wrong for the sake of complexity. And really, you know, like the the let's see. Right, I have some more on that. Okay, so, yeah. The ending has the main bad guy get away, which doesn't have to be a bad thing, although it would be easy for it to get frustrating, considering the entire movie is focused on nothing other than him being stopped. But I do wonder if the fact that a lot of people love that the hitman got shot, but also love the ending, means that people were focusing on the wrong bad guy. Like, how can you both be crowd-pleasing in the ending and refuse to deliver the thing that everyone was hoping for? In fact... I think maybe the movie would have been better if Popeye was about to shoot the hitman, but then another cop intervened and said, you can't shoot a man who's running away. And in fact, the hitman also got away by the end of the movie. You know, personally, I felt both the satisfaction of the assassin dying and the uh, frustration of, yeah, yeah, the frustration of Charnier getting away, but it wasn't like a bad thing. It wasn't like, oh man, it was a waste of time watching a movie. It was like, Ah, uh, they work so hard, though, you know, but it wasn't a bad thing. For some people, I'm sure it's, uh, yeah. I appreciate that the movie makes sure to tell the audience that sometimes Doyle's hunches are wrong and has led to the death of the fellow officer. The movie even ends with him accidentally killing Mulderig. And, let's see. And, yeah, you know, the, the other time... We, we don't know the circumstances of the other time. We just know that it got a cop killed. But that might be that, you know, he sent someone, he, he sent a fellow cop into a situation that that fellow cop couldn't handle, that kind of thing, you know. But here, 
like this is the worst case scenario who he actually shot the the guy that yeah he shot a fellow cop but a lot of audience didn't think that audience members didn't think it was such a bad thing because they didn't like Mulder Abel. I think the movie should have had him accidentally shoot Cloudy and be emotionally devastated by it and at the very end we find out that the entire mission was a failure they didn't stop Sh Shanye in part due to corruption on the police force but both when it came out and today a number of audiences and critics don't seem to take away from the movie that Doyle and his extreme methods don't always solve the problems in fact you know he's arguably as repulsive if not necessarily as damaging as the criminals that he hunts which seems to be you know at least some of what William Frickin wanted us to take away from the movie instead a lot of audiences and some critics expressed frustration that the movie said that Doyle didn't win at the end they had expected that and when their expectations were weren't met it didn't need it didn't lead to introspection but only disappointment the culture in America surrounding police was simply so fervently in favor of cops that when cops explicitly fail after using extreme means a lot of people seemed unwilling to accept that the cops had done something wrong and all this despite the fact that for the liberties that the movie does take with its depiction of the actual events the fact that they were ultimately unsex uh, unsuccessful certainly hack you know Doyle wasn't completely unsexful he did you know meet up with that girl on the bike anyway ultimately unsuccessful is completely based on reality I wanted to briefly say yes I do want to acknowledge today there is there are a number of people who are actually looking to improve things you know to to hold police accountable and to you know change the police training so that they aren't killing so many innocent people now I've seen some criticize that the guy takes the car entirely apart except for that one thing and then you know let's see yeah and and says you know can't find the drugs and has to be told to remove that last part maybe it should have been that Doyle impatiently walks in asks why hasn't he found the drugs yet since he's taking the car almost entirely apart and then without words the guy just takes out the last parts revealing that's where the drugs are and maybe he says something like you need to learn the virtue of patience you know some some yeah it's it's I, I don't know why they did it that way I really yeah but again very few criticisms other than political ones of the movie the, the craft is is just yeah incredible that is it for the entire video so hit me up in the comments let me know what is your favorite movie like this do you like this better than bullet you know what just in general what's your favorite cop based you know cops versus like major criminal kind of thing story and yeah do you think that they should have stopped here or do you wish that the later attempts at making more of a series out of this not not just the second movie but they actually did make like a TV pilot but it failed or something like that yeah do you do you think it should have been a, a TV show if you like this video please thumbs up subscribe hit that little bell there should be a link to my main channel page once you more links to stuff like the relevant playlists a suggested video for you watch on screen right about now I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie and recently the reviewing thoughts videos tend to come up very similar to this one in other words if you want more videos like this you're in luck you can check out my back catalog, back catalog as well as catch my video next week hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoy watching and recording and I'll catch you next time